Hello, my name is Mike Marshall, and today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Uh, I'm going to begin with some introductory remarks about um, apologetics in general. And one of the things to keep in mind is that the purpose of apologetics, in, in my way of thinking, is to remove barriers to understanding the gospel clearly and accurately and remove barriers to understanding its implications. So there are a lot of people who um, have that barrier of not being sure whether or not there really is a God, either because of what they've been taught or what, what they've heard, maybe in a classroom or from friends. And so it's important to um, address that kind of obstacle. Um, I'll share a little story that um, illustrates this. Um, I was working at a, a, a restaurant when I was in college, and there was a friend that I got to know, a co-worker, who uh, was from Europe. And a friend of mine had tried to talk with him about uh, Christianity, and he was very nice, very amiable, and sat and listened to the whole thing. My friend said, so, you know, what do you think about it? And he said, well, you know, I really appreciate you sharing this with me, but I have a problem with your starting point. Um, I'm an atheist. I, I don't really believe that there is a God who you say loves me. And um, so she was speaking with him, and she understood what he said. And then she tried again a few weeks later, and he was nice again and listened to everything and was um, amiable. And he repeated the same thing. So I hear what you're saying. I think I understand it, but I can't even begin with your starting point. So my friend came to me because she knew I read all of these strange books about philosophy and uh, said, maybe you can talk with this guy and, and see what's going on. So I had a chance to sit down with him and I said, um, I understand you have this barrier here, this starting point that um, you're an atheist, you don't believe there is a God. And I said, what if I could sit down with you and give you some reasons for rejecting your atheism? Would you be interested? And he said, uh, sure, sure. I, I, that sounds like something I'd be interested in, in hearing. And so I did sit down with him and I shared with him um, pretty much what I'm going to be sharing with, with you. And after that, then he was ready to hear the gospel in a, in a very different way. He was ready to hear it. Um, and he had rejected his atheism. In fact, he came to my house when he was traveling around the country before he went to Europe. And he stopped by and he said to me, um, I really appreciate what you shared with me a few weeks ago. And I just wanted to tell you that this has turned my life upside down. He said, I've had to rethink everything about my life because everything I did, all my plans, my hopes, they were all based on atheism. And now I have chucked that and I'm going to begin looking into Christianity. Um, and so for him, that was a legitimate kind of uh, barrier. And so I'm going to be sharing with you um, much of what I shared with him. Um, another example of how I've kind of used this is actually in teaching a course. And I went through a semester kind of walking through this step by step with a group of about 30, 35 students. Um, and many of them were, um, were very impressed with the argument and it really made them rethink uh, their positions and their worldview as well. So um, I think that's to, to let you know that what I'm sharing with you is something that has been effective in both an academic setting and also just in just talking with a friend. Um, so you don't feel like you have to have a, a PhD in philosophy or that your friend has to have a PhD in philosophy to understand what I'm going to be sharing with you. Um, so that's by way of uh, a preface. Uh, the other thing that I want to do is talk about two things that are pretty important um, to this argument. Um, one is something that's called the principle of sufficient reason. Um, and that's uh, uh, kind of a 50 cent word for saying that we have this intuition that whenever we see events occurring one after the other, that there's some causal relation between them. Um, so anything, a formal way of looking at it is that for any event that occurs, um, that event has a cause that is sufficient or reason that is sufficient to explain why it occurred. Now there's a uh, well-known Scottish philosopher, um, David Hume, who gave an argument um, trying to do some um, damage to that intuition that we have about causality. And basically he says something like this. We can look at a pool table. We can see a, um, a ball hitting another ball and then that one flying off into a pocket. And we think that 
The first ball hitting the second is what caused the second ball to go into the pocket. But he says that, but we can't really see that. We can't really see what that causal connection is. That's something that we kind of infer. We kind of presume or assume that something is there. They could be totally unrelated. And he is appealing to something that when we see things empirically um, or, or visually, um, it's something that uh, we may not be seeing everything that's going on. And what we think is going on, there may be something else underlying that. And there are many people who think what that means is that our whole notion of causality is just torn apart. That, uh, and of course, if you did that, you'd have to throw all of science out the window. And that, that wouldn't be a really good thing. Um, but Hume really hasn't done that. What he really has done is, is said that our understanding of causality is imperfect. And that when we see events following one after the other, doesn't mean that we know everything about why one thing leads to the other. That the thing it, that we should really be um, careful of is making those connections and concluding with certainty that A caused B. He's not saying nothing causes anything else. That B has no cause or that A has no effect. And that's something that's important to keep in mind. Um, there is um, a writer um, whose name is Alexander Pruss, who talks a lot about the principle of sufficient reason, different ways to um, describe it. That's something that um, I'll have in my notes that you can, you can refer to later. But I just want you to know that um, that's important. And Hume's objection to how we think and talk about causality is not a rejection of causality altogether. In fact, Hume himself um, says that he doesn't reject causality altogether, just the way we label things as one causing the other. So um, let's begin with the cosmological argument, and it starts at a place that um, pretty much everyone can agree with, and that is you exist. Um, I have had maybe one or two occasions where someone tried to deny that. Um, as you can imagine, it wasn't very effective. <laughs> but um, it, is, it starts at a, a point of, of certainty. Um, in order to deny your own existence, obviously you'd have to exist to do that. So you would contradict yourself in the very act of saying, I don't exist. And from there, we're going to use different rules of logical deduction to, um, to get to the point where we are able to explain the existence that you have. Now, um, we start with your existence and we ask the question, why do you exist? Or how has it happened that you've come to exist? And we've got two possibilities. We can say that there is either an infinite chain of events that have led up to your existence or a finite series of events that have led up to your existence. Unless, of course, you want to make the statement that uh, you're the only thing that exists, which you could, but then you wouldn't be watching this video, would you? <laughs> so let's presume that you're not going to say something like that. And let's talk about these two different options. Is there an infinite series of events leading up to your existence, or is it finite? Now, usually when I talk with people, they'll say they, they want to avoid the finite option right away because they know where that's going to lead. <laughs> Um, and they don't want to, uh, to give up the, the game that quickly. So let's say, let's say it's an infinite series of events. Now, in doing this, um, we don't have to talk about exactly how you came to be. So we don't need to talk about things like evolution or anything like that. We just say that history coming up to you is just goes back forever. There is no beginning. So you could say the universe has always been here, or you could say just uh, something has always been around. But in either case, it goes back infinitely. Now there's a problem with that, and the problem is this. If I would have flipped the question and say, let's imagine the future. Let's imagine the future going on indefinitely. Let's say there's an infinite series of events in the future, and I ask you the question, how long will it take to finish that series of events? Now, the answer is obvious, it won't finish. You just, you can't. Um, you can't traverse an infinite series of events in time. It just can't happen by definition. So now, if you can't reverse an infinite series going forward, you also can't reverse, you, you can't reverse an infinite series going backwards. So let's talk about this supposed infinite series of events behind you. We have a problem there, and that is, if there really is an infinite series of events behind you, 
then you're saying an infinite series of events have come to completion. Because everything that is needed to come up to you has happened because you're here. Remember we started by saying you're here, you exist. So if you can't traverse an infinite series, that means you can't exist. So if there's an infinite series of events behind you, you don't exist, but you do which means there, is, there isn't an infinite series behind you, which means it's finite. So how far back can we go? Well, we really don't need to have a number of years or anything like that. We just need to know it stops at some point. And we need to ask some important questions about that stopping point. We know it's the beginning. It's what many philosophers from time immemorial have called the first cause or the prime mover or that kind of thing. But we need to start asking some questions about what is the nature of that particular thing. We don't know what it is yet. Um, well, there are a couple of things that we can know. One is that it is uncaused. Otherwise, it couldn't be the first thing. It couldn't be the stopping point in the series. It's got to be uncaused. So there's nothing that caused it, which means this is the thing that has always existed. It's always been there. It didn't come into existence. And if that's the case, that means it really depends on nothing. Let's think about our own existence, for example, as humans. There are lots of things we depend on. We depend on air, we depend on water, we depend on food. Um, and part of that is because we are finite creatures. We're finite. Um, and so if you were to deprive us of any of those essential things, then we would, we would die. But if there's nothing that brought you into existence, that means that anything else that's out there is something that you caused if you're, the, if you're the first cause. And so that means you're not dependent on anything. You are totally self-sufficient. And there is nothing else, no other thing that exists that is like that. So that's a very important distinction between this first cause and what we would describe ourselves as as these you know, finite creatures. Now, there's one thing that is it's often a concern about this kind of argument, and that is um, if you get to the point where you have this first cause, do you really have something that we would be comfortable calling God? Um, most forms of this argument leave that kind of lacking. You have kind of this cold philosophical construct that is not anything that you would call God or be tempted to worship or anything like that. Um, there's something different um, that I hope you'll see in what I'm going to share with you as this continues, and that is that um, the first cause, uh, there, there are a lot more things that we can know about the first cause. There are actually 10 attributes that I'm going to go through in the rest of this argument to unpack it. And at the end, you'll see that this is something that you would be comfortable calling God and something that you could see, yeah, this is a being that I can worship. So, um, so let's continue. There are a couple of things that I want to talk about um, kind of reviewing what I've gone over so far. Um, one of the objections that comes up is that, well, how do I know that maybe the universe didn't just pop into existence out of nothing? There's no first cause, it just, boom, there it is. Um, there's some serious problems with that, that proposition. Let's imagine we have nothingness. And this is different than just imagining space that's kind of black and a void and no stars. This is truly nothingness, there's nothing in it. So we're gonna say something just pops into existence. So the question is, how do you get something from nothing? How does that occur? Um, there are some people who want to say, if they know something about theoretical physics and quantum mechanics, they'll say, well, there's some atomic particles and that kind of thing happens in that realm, doesn't it? Things just kind of pop into existence out of nothing. Um, well, actually, that's not the case. That, that is not what happens in subatomic particles. Most of the things that we think of as, um, I guess you'd say most of the things that we think of as very mysterious and quantum physics is, is not a matter of the universe itself being just kind of indeterminate, but it's really a matter of us not having the ability to perceive what's going on. And that's, that's the main barrier there. So something popping into existence out of nothing is not something that happens in, in quantum mechanics. The question is philosophically, can you do this? Can you get something from nothing? Now here's the thing that we have to think of. In nothingness, there is no causality at all. 
There is no potentiality, which means there isn't even the potential of anything at all. There's no causality, there's no law of physics, so even if you could say in quantum mechanics things pop into existence out of nothing, you don't have quantum mechanics and nothingness. There's nothing there at all. So if you want to say the universe just popped into existence out of nothing, um, what you're presenting really is not something that can either be a scientific argument or a valid philosophical argument, it's just a hypothesis. It's all you have is a hypothesis that maybe this could happen. And there are many who would argue that it's even a meaningless hypothesis, that if you look at the meaning of the term nothingness, you just, just you can't have anything in there that would give you anything at all. No causality, no potentiality, no laws of physics, no quantum mechanics, nothing at all. Um, but there are some people who want to kind of go down that road to avoid there being a first cause, and it really just, just doesn't work. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind, that that's not really a valid option. So we've got this first cause, and now we're thinking about, we know it's uncaused, we know that it's totally self-sufficient. It doesn't depend on anything. There's something else that we know about the first cause, and that is the first cause has power, the ability to make things happen, for lack of a um, better way to put it. And so if the first cause has power, it is power in an unlimited fashion. Now let me explain this. Um, for any other creature that has powers or abilities, the, the, the scope, the limitations of those abilities is pretty much um, defined and determined by how it came into being and the nature that it has. Now, also by what you're, what you're dependent on. Now, if you're a being that's not dependent on anything, there's nothing that brought you into existence, you don't need anything, you're totally self-sufficient, then there really are no limitations on you. There's nothing that you could say you have this limitation or, or, or that. So any ability that the first cause does have, the first cause has it in an unlimited capacity. So if the first cause has power, then it has unlimited power. Some people may say, well, it's just the most powerful, but I'm not sure how that makes any difference. <laughs> if you can do anything you want with what's created, then you know that's the same thing as being all powerful. Um, so, the first cause is not created, totally self-sufficient, and all-powerful. Um, now, here's something else. If the first cause is all-powerful, that means it also has power over itself. Not only can control whatever it created, it can control itself. And that's what we call self-control. We know that in what's created, there is order, there's design and things like that, there's some um, information there. If you do any reading on information theory, you'll find out that the world, the biological world, natural sciences, is full of information, intricately organized um, constructions of, of um, biology and chemistry and things like that. So if we've got information in what's been created, then we have to have some kind of intelligence in what created it. Um, some kind of knowledge. So the first cause also has knowledge and intelligence. Now just like with power, any, any ability or attribute it has, it has in an unlimited fashion. So that means that it's all-knowing, knows everything. If it knows everything, it also knows everything about itself, which is what we generally think of as being self-aware. So it has self-control and it's self-aware. At this point, we have a first cause that we can call something that is living or a person um, in a common vernacular because it's self-aware and has self-control. We're not talking about some impersonal force that has no intelligence, no guidance, no purpose, no knowledge, just out there randomly things are happening because this force is there. We're talking about something that does have control, does have intelligence, does have knowledge. So from this, we can see some, some other attributes as well. So we've got uh, self caused, sorry, we've got uncaused, we've got um, all knowing, all powerful. Now, there's something interesting about the first cause being all powerful. Um, you may have heard the, I guess you'd call it a little riddle or puzzle um, that goes like this What happens when an irresistible force 
meets an unmovable object. It's supposed to be kind of like a little paradox or a conundrum. What happens when an irresistible force meets an unmovable object? Many people are stumped by the puzzle. Some people pick one or the other to say, well, the unmovable object wins or the irresistible force wins. The answer to this nice little riddle is that it can't happen. If there is an irresistible force, by definition, there is no unmovable object, and vice versa. If there is an unmovable object, by definition, there is no irresistible force. So that means you can only have one. So if indeed the first cause is all-powerful, there can only be one all-powerful being. There cannot be another. And that is part of what we might refer to as holy of being um, wholly separate, wholly other. Um, there's a moral component too, which we'll talk about later. Um, but the first cause is a very unique being. There is no other like the first cause. So um, that's another important attribute. Now, I haven't talked about this yet, but this might be a good time to bring it in. There are a lot of people that will say, well, why, you know, what caused the first cause? And, and why do you say it has to be uncaused? Because if I'm a creature and I, there's an explanation for my existence, what's the explanation for the existence of the first cause? Doesn't everything have to have an explanation? This goes back to understanding the, the principle of sufficient reason also. If it exists, doesn't have to have a reason for it to exist. Um, so when we're talking about the first cause, the reason why we can't say, that, I mean, there are a couple of options. We can say that it's self-caused, and we'll talk about that, that would involve a contradiction. Nothing can be self-caused. You would have to exist and not exist simultaneously. Now, if we want to throw out the law of non-contradiction, we can, but if we do, then there's no reason for us to keep talking. Because without that, you can't have language at all. So, if we keep the law of non-contradiction in, we can't say that something exists and it doesn't exist at the same time in the same way. So nothing can be self-caused. Um, it wasn't caused by something else. We've already established that. It couldn't have popped into existence out of nothing. We've already covered that. So the explanation for its existence is within itself, namely that it is um, an eternal being. Because of the kind of being it is, it could not have come into being. It's almost like this. It's almost like um, what some people may call, a, what you might call a category fallacy. Um, this is the kind of being about which that question is meaningless. It's like saying, what does blue smell like? Right? Blue is the kind of thing about which that question is meaningless. Similarly, for this first cause, that kind of question, well, what explains the existence, you know? It's the kind of thing about which that kind of question is just meaningless, it just falls apart. Um, so that's why we don't go down that road. So moving forward, we've got um, several attributes already laid out. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about, and this one is pretty involved, it gets pretty tricky at, at some points, is uh, whether or not the first cause is a moral being. Um, is there morality, goodness, that kind of thing? So in order to talk about that, we have to talk about morality in general. And that is, it's important to understand that morality is a code of conduct. That there is a, there's a list of do's and don'ts. And when you are in accord with that list of do's and don'ts, you are considered morally good. And when you're not, morally evil. So there has to be some kind of standard that you are, you are appealing to. Um, in order to say that something is good or evil. Now, if there is a standard of right and wrong for divine beings, then the first cause would know that because the first cause is all-knowing. If there are certain actions that the first cause is supposed to, um, to go by, then the first cause would know that, and the first cause would know how to do it because he's all-powerful. So he can do the things, that he's supposed to do. He knows what he's supposed to do. Now the other thing is, where would this moral standard come from? Because there's, there's nothing that brought him to existence, there's nothing over and above him. Well, it would have to come from his nature. 
It would have to be something that's wrapped up in its nature. And, and that actually um, is somewhat how um, we, can, we can think of our own morality. And that is that the nature of the being is pretty much what determines what kind of moral code it's supposed to go against. It's, it's measure up. So for example, we wouldn't expect um, animals to have the same moral code that humans have. We wouldn't expect humans to have the exact same moral code that some other weird type of being that you, know, you can imagine would have. It, it's appropriate to the nature of the being. So the moral code for the first cause is going to be appropriate to the nature of the first cause. And it's got to come from the nature of the first cause because there's nothing else for it to come from. So here's the question. So the first cause would know what right and wrong is, could always do the thing that is right because he has total self-control and total self-awareness. The question is, does he, would he? Um, always do the right thing so that you would be able to say that the first cause is good. We've established, I think, that the first cause is a moral being, but is the first cause good? Now, if the first cause is not good, that means that there would be some kind of dissonance. There would be a disconnect between what he knows he ought to do, what he can do, and what he's actually doing. So there's, uh, you could call maybe some kind of internal tension or, or dissonance. Now, for there to be dissonance in any being, there has to be parts, either um, material parts or substantive parts. Um, it has to be made of parts either essentially or accidentally. So let me talk about what the difference between that is. So in a, something that's made of parts essentially, for example, would be maybe um, think of an analogy of a, of a human has different parts of their body. Or you could say is made of body and soul, spiritual and physical. So these are essential um, parts. Something that would be um, accidental in nature, not accident like you know one car banging into another, but something that's just non-essential but true of the being would be something like um, the different desires and ideas and dreams that you have, those would be accidental properties of your mind because you could have any other kinds of thoughts. Um, and because we're created beings and we think in time and sequence and stuff like that, that's the way our mind works. Um, so the question is, is there dissonance in the first cause? What kind of nature does the first cause have that we would be able to say there are parts? Um, now, the thing is, is that if there are parts and um, these parts can, and there's essential, these are essentially different parts and they can have different arrangements and that kind of thing, that means that it's possible for this being to have um, essential change, change in its essential nature. Um, and that is actually not possible with the first cause. This actually leads us to another um, attribute, and that is the first cause is immutable or unchangeable in its essence. And that's because of the following. If you think of the first cause, the first cause has to be timeless, um, atemporal, outside of time. If we think of time space as what we're all in, so we're thinking about whether or not God is unchangeable because this dissonance, as we talked about, requires there to be some components, some essential parts. So if there is essentially different components in the first cause, then these can have different arrangements. So that means essentially it can change. But if we look at time space, which is what we normally think of as what we're in, in this, this physical universe, um, time space would have been created by the first cause. And if that's the case, then the first cause can't be subject to time, which makes it atemporal or outside of time. Um, so the first cause is also an atemporal being. Now, in, the first cause could step inside of time if it wanted to, or be outside of time, but it's not bound by it. It's not restricted by it. Um, the other thing is that if there is dissonance, there's also the possibility of improvement um, or getting worse also. <laughs> um, so then we'd have something where we'd have to say the first cause is actually 
um, changing, evolving, um, becoming more perfect. But remember, any ability or attribute that the first cause has, it already has in an unlimited fashion, and the first cause is totally self-sufficient, which means it can't get better because it doesn't need anything other than itself. It already has everything that it needs. So there is no possibility of improvement in the first cause. So there is no possibility of improvement. There's no possibility of essential change because this, essentially the first cause is not subject to time. So that means it's unchangeable or what we often call immutable in, in philosophical terms, which means there can't be that dissonance with the first cause. So any moral code that the first cause knows from its own nature, it knows perfectly, it can perform perfectly and always performs perfectly, which means the first cause is good. So you have a good divine being. So you have a, a divine being that's the first cause, uncaused, totally self-sufficient, unique, um, and holy. Now we've added goodness, so that's the other dimension of holiness. Um, you also have a first cause who's personal, is self-aware, um, is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise. And now you have something that is not as abstract and cold as just a prime mover, for example, that Aristotle talks about. Um, you have something that is much more robust than that in the idea of the first cause. And I think that is something that warrants the designation God. Um, I, don't, I can't think of what else you would call <laughs> something that fits this description. Um, and also uh, the creator of everything that there is. Now there are a number of things that are a consequence of this. Um, there are many other worldviews and positions and even some world religions that are not consistent with this description of, um, of God. For example, there's one idea that God is everything, pantheism, that the whole world, the physical, spiritual, material world that we live in, that all of that stuff together makes God. But we know that is not the case with the first cause. The first cause is separate from um, the, the created order. We also have, there's another worldview that says that um, there are many gods, multiple gods. Some worldviews will say there are a few or, or, or whatever, and then others I will say there are thousands or hundreds, and then like the Greek pantheon or the Roman pantheon, things like that. Um, but we know that can't be the case. There's only one God because God is all-powerful, and therefore there can't be another all-powerful being. So that's kind of ruled out. And there are many other worldviews, if you start to think about them, are they consistent with this um, description of God? If they are not, then they are not logically viable. And in particular, and here's something that intuitively we don't think this way, but it also means that those worldviews are not consistent with your existence. Because remember, that was our starting point. And we're starting to look at what's consistent with the fact that you exist. Well, like I said, it's not intuitive, but you look through the argument, pantheism is not consistent with your existence. If you accept pantheism, you'd have to, in some sense, reject your existence. Um, now, when I gave this argument in my, cl in my class that I, that I taught, um, there was one person at the end of the class, we got to the end of the argument, I open for questions. Actually, the way I went through it was each week I would go through a different section and give people a chance to ask any questions. And then I would give them um, books, literature, websites that are atheist websites. And I say, go through them, look at them, come back Monday and ask me some more questions. And we won't move forward till everything's addressed. So we had lots of things around along the way. We got to the end. One guy raised his hand. He says, I have, I said, do you have a question? And he said, no, I have a comment. I say, okay. And he says, I don't like the conclusion. I said, okay, that's fine. You are allowed to not like the conclusion. Can you tell me why? You know, what point along the way that we go off track or make a mistake? And I had a summary of the argument up on a board. He's looking through and he says, well, I can't, I can't really find anything. I can't put my finger on something. And I said, okay, um, do you need some time to think about it? Something like you kind of feel it, but you can't express it. And he said, no, not really. And I said, you just don't like the conclusion. 
And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I just don't like it. And I said, okay, that's fine. But now you have to wrestle with the fact that your atheism is irrational. Because you've just told me now, I, I, I still want to be an atheist, but I don't have a reason. <laughs> In fact, I have lots of reasons against being an atheist now, and I just don't like the conclusion. And that's fine. But now you don't have an excuse anymore. You have to, you have to wrestle with this. Why? Why am I insisting on being an atheist? It's not because it's the rational thing to do. There's some other reason. And you have to figure out what that reason is. It probably has something to do with the consequences <laughs> of there being a God. And most of the time it does. You figure, well, if there's a God, and he has all these attributes you're talking about, it sounds like I might be accountable to this God. And a lot of people don't like that. But you have to realize that you'll have to suppress that truth if you're going to go on staying in, in, in that position. Now, there's something that I want to talk about. Um, I could have talked about at the beginning, but I wanted to save it until we got later, later on. Um, this whole argument, uh, the cosmological argument, falls under a, I guess you could say, a discipline called natural theology. And there are some people who don't think that natural theology is valid. They think what you're, what you're doing in an argument like this is that you're using logic to try to get to um, the existence of God, and doesn't that, doesn't that put logic or reason above God? Um, and in some sense, doesn't that put man above God? You know, because you're thinking of your own mind, reasoning through things, and have you become the arbiter of truth now? And in that regard, and so, um, and that's a that's an important thing um, that we need to address. I think it's, it's an important point for someone um, to bring up. But but here's here's the problem with it: if you use logic to get to the point of God's existence, and then you say, well, you can't really do that. That puts logic before God. You need to put God first. You need to start there with God, and it's because of God that we have logic and all this other kind of stuff, which makes sense because God is the first cause, um, and it's responsible for all the other things that exist. But here's the problem. That's in what you call the order of being or ontology. There's a difference in the order of knowing or epistemology, and there are a number of ways to illustrate this. The first is that the word God itself has no meaning without logic. Um, because you have to have the law of non-contradiction in place before God can mean what we've just described God to mean as opposed to the exact opposite. So in order for even the concept of God to make sense, you've got to have logic. So logic is actually a, a vehicle of sorts that just brings us to that point. But it doesn't mean that that vehicle is more important than a destination. We can think, for example, of let's say you, you get in a car and you drive to church and you go to church and you worship there. Are you going to worship the car that brought you to the church so you could worship? No. And sure, the car brought you there, but that doesn't mean that the car is more important than actually getting you um, to that point. And so it doesn't put reason above God. In fact, what you do is, if you use logic, it brings you to the point of God's existence. You understand what God's attributes are. At that point, you know that God is the sole arbiter of truth. And God would have the ultimate authority. He's the only one that's all-knowing and all-powerful and holy and all-good. He's the only one. So God is going to be your ultimate standard at that point. And any time, once you learn more about God and, and what God wants, at that point, you will be testing that against what you normally think and what you think is right and wrong and comparing it and making changes and, and adjusting um, accordingly. So far from it being, and some people might say, idolatrous to reason to the existence of God, um, it's not idolatrous at all. Um, and the interesting thing is that for those who would oppose um, doing that, they have to do the very same thing. Because like I said, they've got to use logic to even presuppose God. And the interesting thing is that there are arguments to this effect that you have to start with God, you can't start with reason. 
The interesting thing is that they're using reason to make that argument. Um, you can't just go to someone and, I don't know, just say to them, start with God and just leave it at that. There's, there's an argument that they make. That argument uses reason. And you're inviting that person to use their reason to get to the point to agree with you that they have to start with God before they can use reason. So it's almost like saying reason dictates that we can't start with reason. Um, so that's, that, you know, that's a problem with that. And that's important to understand that this cosmological argument and, and other arguments in natural theology don't um, kind of make that mistake that is often an accusation. So let's go back to um, the argument, the cosmological argument. And there are a couple of things that we want to um, talk about next as far as some of the consequences um, of this argument. We mentioned before about there are just certain worldviews that are just not consistent um, with the God that we have just described with the list of attributes. So what that means is that continuing with, you know, using the law of non-contradiction and things like that, um, anything that conception of, of God or the attributes of God that contradicts this has to be false, unless we've made some mistake along the way and coming up with these attributes. So, um, in my opinion, there are three major world religions that you could say are consistent with this understanding or conception of God. Um, and they are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, they all have a conception of God that is consistent with the attributes that we've just listed. Um, and so now the issue is, you know, what's the difference between those three? Now that obviously goes beyond the cosmological argument, um, but that's what you have to deal with next. And what that is, is what they say about Jesus Christ. That's the central difference between those three. Um, and it's a very important difference because Jesus claimed to be God. So the God that we have just talked about at the conclusion of this argument is who Jesus claims to be. Now, of course, um, if Jesus is God, that's going to give us a whole lot more information about who God is and what he's like that is way beyond the scope of something like a cosmological argument, um, which gets back to one of my introductory comments. There is a purpose and limitation to this kind of argument. It removes barriers to understanding the gospel, barriers to understanding its implications. Um, it clarifies things that are confused. So we get to the point now where there's a lot of clarification that's been done. We've got this notion of God, and what we've clarified is there are certain worldviews that are not logically consistent with, um, with this, this notion of God. So um, I challenge you to look at the claims of Jesus because he claims to be God, and you will learn much more about who God is by looking at who Jesus is and what he's done and what he said. Um, so with this argument, there are some other questions that come up. Uh, one of them is, as we're going down the list of, um, of steps from one to the next, um, is it possible that if we had started somewhere else, we might end up with a different conclusion, um, if we had a different starting point? We started with, you know, you exist. And the reason why I bring this up is that in, um, in philosophical circles, it's kind of known just from reading um, Socrates. One of um, Socrates' successes, which really kind of Plato, who we know most about Socrates from Plato, and you look at those arguments, he's really good at getting his opponent to agree with his conclusion at the end. One of the things about Socrates is if you don't agree with the starting point, you won't get trapped into his conclusion. <laughs> um, and so a lot of times people will think, well, is this argument just a little bit of sophistry here and you kind of tricked me along the way and if I'd been more careful, I wouldn't have jumped on board to begin with. Um, so we looked at an alternative in the starting point earlier. We talked about you being able to just deny your own existence and you know, then I don't, I don't, I don't have to deal with this. <laughs> Um, and we talked about why that doesn't work. Well, there's, there's another objection that someone can make 
in, in the starting point. And that is, let's suppose I admit that I exist, but what if I call into question whether or not there has to be an explanation for my existence? Maybe there doesn't. Maybe I'm just here. Um, now, we're going to grant, of course, that you're not claiming to be God. <laughs> um, because it is possible to have a scenario where only one being exists, right? The first cause, before he created anything else. That was a situation where there was only one thing that existed. Now, are you that one thing? That's the question that you have to ask. What do you have to be to be that one thing? Well, I couldn't tell you until we went through the argument because then I'd be putting the conclusion in the beginning. But now you can know you have to have all those attributes if you're going to claim to be the only being that exists. Um, so unless you are willing to claim to be God, then that alternative is not an option. That I exist, but there is no explanation for my existence. I'm just here. Um, and so whether you start with you exist or whether you don't exist, which is a contradiction, or whether you say I exist and there is no explanation for my existence, there is a God. So either you're God or you're not. Now I'm going to assume that you're probably not God. <laughs> Although I'm sure God is watching this video. <laughs> um, but um, it's important to think about this now, not just from kind of a philosophical abstract sense, because the cosmological argument is, you know, it's, it's rigorous and it's philosophical, and it can seem, um, can seem a little cold at, at, a, at a point. So the question arises, okay, so you've got this argument, you've got the conclusion, so what? Why, is, why should this make a difference at all? And going back to the illustration that I used in introductory comments, uh, my friend who said, this has changed my life, it's turned my life upside down, why would he have come to that point? And that is because he actually realized what some of the personal consequences were. He didn't just hear the argument and says, wow, that's a cool idea. He heard the argument and at the end of it, he said, I must change my life, is what he said. Um, one thing that I didn't say when, in my, my conversation with him, at one point I asked him, um, I said, I can sit down with you and we can talk about this argument for the existence of God, but I, I want to know um, if this means anything to you. If, is this just a mental exercise, a game, or is it something real? And here's the question I want to ask you. If you came to the position where you knew it was rational to reject your atheism and to accept um, theism, would you seriously consider Christianity? And he looked at me and he said, if I really did become convinced that atheism was false and theism was true, I would be a fool not to look into Christianity. Now, let me explain why. This is kind of an extension of the argument. What does it mean personally that there is a God that has these attributes? Well, it means that you're, you exist, and that your existence is not an accident. Your existence is a result of a God who knows everything and is all powerful and decided, decided that you would exist. Now, this is a God that doesn't just act randomly. This is a God that has total self-control, which means there is a purpose and intention for your existence. Now, we normally go through life just kind of making up our own purposes and goals and not giving any thought at all to whether or not that's the right purpose. We think it's like going to a buffet. It doesn't really matter whether I get chicken now or beef later. I just get whatever I want. I go to the salad bar. It's just a preference, a taste. Um, however, if there is a design and intent and purpose for your existence, then it's not just a matter of you choosing whatever you want. You need to find out what that is because there is one beyond what you would just choose randomly or choose by preference or choose because you happen to grow up in a certain area or culture or anything like that. And this is what my friend realized, because he had based his life on atheism, which actually gave him just kind of freedom to do whatever he wants. And now he realizes, wait, a God with these attributes, who is responsible for why I exist, created me with a purpose. I need to find out what that purpose is, because there could be consequences 
because this is a moral being who cares about right and wrong. So why is he not going to care about right and wrong with what he's created? And that is why he saw that he would be a fool, really foolish, <laughs> not to look into Christianity at that point. And so you really need to, to think about this argument and these attributes, go through the list and figure out what does it mean to me because I am a creation of this God and this is the kind of God that we're talking about. So it's not just abstract philosophical, it's not just a mental game or exercise because we're not talking about, a lot of people, it's, this is, uh, a, a lot of people will look at philosophy and separate it from their life. Uh, for example, I was um, a graduate student in philosophy at University of Virginia, and I had a friend who was uh, focusing in ethics. I, I was also. And he was writing this paper where um, he was constructing um, kind of a system of ethics, and he asked me to look over it and give him some feedback. So I looked at it, I was reading through it, and I realized that there was nothing, nothing in his paper at all that talked about evil. It just wasn't there. And I looked at him and I said, why, you know, why did you, is, your, is this the completed <laughs> paper here? You have more you're going to write? He said, why do you ask that? Because you're talking about morality and a system of ethics and you don't talk about evil at all. Why is that? And he said, well, it gets pretty messy when you're writing, trying to write a system of ethics and you've got you to gotta address evil. It gets pretty messy. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, of course it does, but why are you leaving it out? And, he's, and I said, look, are you just playing mental games here? Is this just like a philosophical sport for you? Or are you really trying to do something of significance? And he just kind of looked at me and he said, well, okay, as it stands, it's just a philosophical kind of game. Um, I wouldn't mind doing something significant, but I don't know how to address evil. I mean, if I throw it in there, my paper just falls apart. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know, it probably would. But you need to realize that if all you're doing is playing games, you know, you know why are you doing philosophy? <laughs> you know, do, do something else. And um, the same thing is true with, you know, with life, actually. Um, you can go through life like it's a game, or you can consider these things. I mean, because what we're talking about here is, is truth. We're not talking about some abstract idea we came up with. Just as real as your existence is, that's how real God's existence is. And you need to remember that was our starting point. There's a lot of things about the starting point that we need to keep in mind at the conclusion. We didn't start in um, no, nowhere's land and end up in nowhere's land. We started in something that you can't deny it's the thing that is most real to you, your own existence. And you need to realize that the truths and this conclusion are just as real and has just as much an impact on you. In fact, uh, there's one thing. Um, I, I, had, I used this argument and a person asked me the question, um, how, how convinced are you that this argument is, is, is right? How convinced are you that God is real? And I told him, I said, you know, you're going to think this is kind of crazy, but I am more convinced that God exists than that you exist. And it's like, how can you say that? It's like, because it's true. Let's think about, let's think about why I believe you exist. Well, I see you. I hear you. I shake your hand. You know, I, I touch you. So we got all this sensory stuff going on, but I could be dreaming, couldn't I? <laughs> right? I could be dreaming. I could be in the matrix, right? You might not, I perceive all this stuff, but you might not be there. I could be deceived, right? So my reasons for believing you exist are all sensory. Now my sensory input can be false. It can be faulty. So I'm pretty confident that you're there, but you know, I have to allow for the possibility that I could be wrong. That's not so with God's existence, because the starting point is there, there are two things primarily that I'm dependent on for the, the reason that I believe that God exists. My own existence and logic. Those are the, those are the two 
things that get me there, as opposed to the thing that gets me to your existence is my sensory input. So my reasons for believing that God exists are actually stronger than my reason for believing that you exist. Because I can't link your existence to mine. I, I can't. It doesn't work that way. Um, so when I told him that, he thought about it and he's like, so, so that would work for anything that you see other than yourself, right? And I said, yeah. The sky, the, the, the grass, the, um, uh, you know, the trees, anything, another person that all of those things, I, I actually can be, I'm actually less confident that those are there because even if I was dreaming, I still exist. And we still start the same starting point and get to the conclusion, even if I'm dreaming. If everything is an illusion, that same God still exists. So it's important for you to realize as real, as strong as you feel your own existence is there, that's as, that's as strong as you should feel that God is actually there. Now, it's interesting that the, uh, the Bible actually talks about that. And it says that there are certain things that can be known about God from what he has made, that his invisible attributes, his divine power, and his glory can be easily seen and known from what he has made. And this is really kind of a philosophical version of that same sentiment. We started with something that God has made, yourself. And from that, we could see certain of his invisible attributes and his divine power and his glory. So that is something that my friend realized when I gave the argument to him. And that is why it turned his life upside down. Otherwise, you'll have to go through life like it's a game. That's what you're doing. Like my friend um, who was a, um, a student in the graduate program, going through his philosophy paper like it was a game, not dealing with the things that, you know, because at one point I told him, I said, you know, the whole, the, the whole problem and, and addressing evil is pretty much why people even talk about ethics to begin with. Why would there be a reason to talk about morality if there were no evil at all, if everything was good? And so you just kind of, they're going through the motions and leaving out the very reason why it's even important. And so you don't want to go through life going through the motions, ignoring the very thing that makes life important. Otherwise, you're playing games with your life and possibly your eternal destiny. Thanks for your time.